Oh my God. 
him off the night on the fellow, and actually said to us, today, that's what you said. You've been bad at me once they do it, even the journalists didn't mind in their work. It's a good job that Jean and I found you before joking about it. Joe! Oh my God, you killed me! It's all right, Lizzie. Joe can't be wrong here. Can he, Harry? You see, you're saying. See? What is this place anyway? Have you heard that? You'll never guess. We're in the Magdalene. The what? The Magdalene asylum for fallen women. Oh my God. That's all right, Lizzie. You're safe now. Joe can't be touching. You can't harm me. Well, you certainly been last night several times, as a matter of fact. <laughs> hey, what are you doing here, Molly? You don't to worry, do you? Ah, no. I had to miss the call to bring you here. If you can't let his life, you'll think I'm cheating on him. So it's my fault. Oh, it's so wrong. Well. There's been something to have to do. You've never managed it on your own. You've never been to get with each other. Of course not. Listen, Jeannie Kens were here. She'll let me know when Joe's got out of his tent when it's safe for me to go back on the street. I'll find you to leave. Thanks, Mom. Thanks a lot. Good morning, girls. We brought you something to eat. There's some porridge and bean bread. Go on, thank you. Thanks very much. Sir, thank you very much, sir. The Reverend Mill is the asylum chaplain. You shall call him Sir at all times. I am Mrs. Mill. You will actually address me as Mum. Come forward, both of you. Gibbons? Yes, ma'am. Steele? That's the name, ma'am. You were very kind last night, Gibbons. I trust that you have lights open now? Yes, thank you, ma'am. You will, of course, have no access to spirits as long as you are here. If this causes you any distress, I'm afraid you'll just have to suffer. Understand? I understand, ma'am. Our doctor, Dr. Ross, will be here shortly to examine you both. It will save everyone a great deal of time and trouble if you tell us now. Are we with you disease? What? Not me, ma'am. No, ma'am. Not as bad as a wall. Well, we shall see. I shall tell you now that if either of you are diseased, you cannot remain here. However, I can arrange for you to be taken to a place where it will be in effect. Perhaps you would care to tell us why you come to us Give us some ideas of background, perhaps. Background? Where you spent your childhood? Where you grew up? What made you go to the Oh, I understand, sir. Perhaps you could tell us. Yes, sir. Something else. What do you think you can do? 
Er will alles dir erklärt, schön, er will alles vorstellen. Fresh. There is more to this than a temporary lapse of training. But according to your records, we are suffering from a severe deterioration in our capital stock. How do you mean, Mr. Kerr? Look here, Brash, when I hired you to establish this enterprise, I provided you with the resources to purchase 15 operatives. Oh, Mr. Kerr, you promised you wouldn't bring that up again. Of course. You bought ten and kidnapped the other five. No, I don't kidnap, Mr. Kerr. That's not a nice one. Procured is what we call it in the trade. I mean, after all, I was only using my initiative. Very commendable, I'm sure. However, the fact remains that you no longer have 15 operatives. Your total complement has been reduced to 11. 12, Mr. Kite. You forgot about Rosie Murdoch. She'll be back as soon as she mends. If she mends, the woman may well be crippled for life. I'm still not sure how she managed to get her legs broken in the first place. It was an accident, Mr. Kite. Yeah, are you sure you never had nothing to do with it? Me? I sometimes think that you're altogether too harsh on these women, Brash. Oh, Mr. Kai, you ask any of these women, I'm like a feather to them. Well, I was a brother anyway. Be that as it may, Brash, even allowing for the possible return of the Murdoch women, you've still managed to lose three operatives in the last four months. Oh, Mr. Kai, it's natural wastage. You've got to expect to lose a last year there. None of it's my fault. No. Let's have some explanation, shall we? They didn't come anyway. Ah, oh. now you came with Paul Butler's bloody missionaries. That man's purpose came round to tell Jean's father where she was. And he came round here with a gang of his thugs, threatening to smash the place up and everything if I didn't let her go. Bloody shame to the last of his doing well here. And that's what you get for using your initiative. You should never have kidnapped the girls in the first place. Right. Finlay. Oh, now that was different. I sold her. Yeah. You sold her for ten pounds, having bought her for a hundred in the first place. Now that's a heavy loss. She was bad with the pox, Mr. Kerr. I've got the customers to think about. If she was that bad, how'd you manage to sell her? Well, I've got my contacts in the old town. They're not so fussy there. Lastly, Brash, what about Maggie Patterson? <sighs> now, you can't put that one on me, Mr. Kerr. You definitely can't. Why did it happen? I want an explanation. How would I know, Mr. Kerr? The lassie's heat was well away there. God knows why she wants to jump off the North Bridge. Certainly had nothing to do with me. I'll put it in a nutshell for you, Brasher. This house is not viable with 11 operatives. 12, Mr. Not even with 12. Unless you can replace these women, I will close you down. Well, I can do that, Mr. Khan. Of course I can. But if you want it done in a hurry, I'll need some extra cash. Oh, no. Oh, no. No money, Brash. Not a penny. Fortunately, there is a way out of your present difficulties. Oh, I can. How would that be, Mr. Kant? I understand that Clara Johnson, the most exclusive madam in town, has made an offer for one of our girls, a certain Molly Stewart. How did you know about that? Never mind how I know. You should have told me. Well, I would have, Mr. Kant. It's just that, well, negotiations are in the very early stages, you see. Has Clara Johnson made an offer? Aye. Four hundred pounds. That's high. No, for her, it's not. She's the best here in Edinburgh, Mr. Kant. I'm not so sure if you want to let her go. That's right, that's why you didn't tell me. You don't want to sell. I want to see this woman, Brash. What the name? The sale of Molly Stewart would provide the capital to put this business back on an even keel. But I don't trust you, Brash. So I want to see for myself if Clara Johnson's price is a fair one. I want to see this woman now. She's not available right now, Mr. No excuses, now I say. Jimmy, come here, I want to see you. Hi, Joe, what is it? I'm going to see if uh, Rosie's free, Rosie. I want to see her now. Rosie's not in. Molly went out last night as well. She's not back here. What? It's all right, Mr. Kant. Lately she's met up with some rich gent who's just took her out for a couple of days. It's all right, she'll be back. You're supposed to keep track of all of the movements. <sighs> Molly's different, Mr. Kant. She's special. It does us good to hear her hate now and again. But don't worry, she won't be back. Well, she better be. If you know what's good for you, Brash, she better be. Right, as you say, Mr. Kant. What the hell did you 
you mean by stolen not to be all wet? I should better come and go in the boy. What? I can't hear my way. Where? A safe place. A place you can't touch her. Oh, all right, Jimmy. What do you want? Let's face it, Joe. I'm out of help for the street. One of these days, Monker or some other shite hop's going to pick me up. Now I'll get 15 days. I'm out of help to go to jail or not. As I say to you, what do you want? I want to be madam, Joe. I want to be madam, stay in the house, just go on the streets for nothing. Suits me. I want to be madam with a madam share of the profits. And if I make you madam, you'll get Molly back? No, it's I've been a good lesson. Always does as she's told. I poor fish, yes. I can get back like that. Aye, we look room. You didn't often see it like this, though. She's like fellow women, sewing and knitting, and clasping away together. I thought it would be no different from the sisters, I know. Not at all. Still, it's not just class for the sake of class. Some important decisions are being made in this room, you know. Oh, aye. Discussions, arguments, even some good ground rumors in this room. You see, sir, some lasses settle down quite easily to the life. Some of us take time. Some of us settle at home. Maybe they're not going to settle. This is where they found out. That's it, Tom. Got it in one.
few minutes, that's all. You could always buy things like a piece of one, but well, it doesn't work. I understand that. Yeah, that's what particular might have required you, Paul. I think it's hard. I think it's easier to get in the police business. Ah, no. As a matter of fact, Minister, this has nothing to do with my life. It's personal. Personal? Molly and me are. Well, we used to be friends. Friends? We were bare together in the two gate. I see. You're a Westerner, Mr. Hunter. I hope you don't mind if I see the four watches here. Of course. This is a refuge, Mr. Hunter. You don't allow yourselves to be harassed by anyone. Not by your former employers. Not by the police. Not even by your family. Oh, well, we're not that kind of friend. All the same, Mr. Hunter. The rest will last the community by shouting.
جو بو که دی نمور چابو هیر ا یو وانت کوز با نو یو استریک کوز یو وانت یو یوز دم اگین یو کوز تو بریک اگین ای We need her back at the house. Oh. There'll be no trouble about it. I mean, they won't try and stop her or anything, will they? No, not really. That's not it. Luigi, I'm sorry, but Mom will be coming back on the phone. What? I'll give her your message, of course. But... What do you mean, Mom won't be coming back on the phone? She's decided to give it up to you. Mom? Our Molly? Our own flash Mom? Are you serious, was it? Aye, so is Molly. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. Ask her yourself if you wish. She was his mother. No, like no. Molly hasn't any female friends or relatives that are only yours. They're bound to know that here. And if I ask to see her, they'll not know me for saying. So that's why you asked for me. Aye. When you see Molly, Lizzie, tell her that Joe Brash and Clara Johnson I've struck a bargain. Clara's prepared to buy her a future. It's no good to me know about that. How? Madge Parker's told us. She had word of it in the street. And it makes no difference. It's a chance in a thousand. Clara Johnson's lasses make a fortune. They're retiring style. Some of them even marry up with the customers. What's wrong with Molly? Suppose she's wanted all her life. If Clara Johnson buys her. She's not for sale, Jane. Not anymore. Oh, great, great for her, eh? But what about me? What am I supposed to do? I've got to go back and tell Joe. What am I going to tell him, was it? Tell him nothing. Leave him. Join us in here. Didn't he do that? Look, it's working for me, and it seems to be working for Molly. Maybe it could work for you, too. You give it a try. Not a chance. Why do you think I asked Molly to bring you here instead of bringing you myself? I can the rules. Not to over 30. Not to be a prison sentence. I feel both times. You could always ask. Molly and I would both speak up for you. Thanks. But there's nothing for it. I'll just have to go back and face it. Mm. Listen, don't worry about me, and I'll be all right. Here, I'm sharp enough for Daniel Hemmer, my Nori. This place. What do they do to you in here? You're off the gym. Molly's off the game. Is it something they put in water, or is it religion? Or what is it? I don't know, Jeannie. Maybe it's nothing to do with this place. Maybe it's just ourselves. We live in a house that has bars in every window and bolts in other doors. Yeah, I've never known so much freedom in all my life. Fault, eh? What? 
You try to do me a favor, right? Then you're selling one at the same time, but who can blame you for that? Ah, so Molly's decided to fly the Cooper ship. No doubt she thinks she can save Clara Johnson some money and make a wee bit of commission for herself on the side, eh? No, Joe, I'm sure it's not that. You're sure? You were sure the last time, were you not? I'll tell you what, I'm sure it. That last is trying to make a fool out of me. What do you think of that, then, Ram? It's got no chance, Joe. Okay, you'd pay good money for that. You're done right now, then. And if she thinks she's not coming back here, she's got another thing coming. If she's not coming back, we'll go over there and snatch her back. Do I think twice? Do I think? You're no fucking good at it, Jeannie, are you? Right, I'm going out here and have a scout around. You two meet me in the tall end. An hour. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, do something for me while I'm away. See to that baggage. John, John, did it! John! Ah, it's kind of high. 
What are you talking about, MJ? It's only two fights. You can manage that way more than to me. Aye, you, what we're going to do is you get yourself in there, find the back door, and let me in grab it, okay? I've been thinking, Joe. Maybe we should have a look at you, know? I mean, just in case. I could just stand here. You just wait where you are. Look, what song you use there? There's nothing to this. This is a piece of cake. Oh, I don't know, Joe. I don't even fancy this. Oh, come on, look. It's a police party woman. Bloody hooers. Now you used to handle the hooers now, you know. It all could be simpler. It's this place, Joe. Something spooky about it. Uh, it gives me the keys. Oh, you're peering, Jesse. Look, stay where you are. I'll take my bloody cell. Oh, we've been caught, pal. What's that? Oh, where is it, did you say? Who the hell are you? I'm John Guinness, a cell officer. And you are not. Get that bastard!
I shouldn't think so. It's, it's on the, the meeting of the Board of Governors at night, or Bye-bye. Please, ladies and gentlemen, if you please. <coughs> Thank you. The first item on the agenda is one of a singular nature, and that we have been asked to consider and pronounce a judgment on admission to the asylum. Now this, I need not tell you, is normally an operational matter, and would under other circumstances be handled by the staff committee. Now, since this has been brought before us is to say an unusual, not to say an irregular occurrence, therefore I would like to start by asking Mrs. Milne, our superintendent, our reasons for asking for this meeting. Mr. Chairman, as you know, the staff committee is empowered to deal with all operational matters and the articles of our constitution. This, however, is an extraordinary matter which is not covered by our powers. I see. Proceed, please. The applicant in question is a person by the name of Jane Kennedy. She is a practice of practice to admit such people. So this woman is completely unsuitable? On the face of the facts, it would appear so. However, our missionary, Madge Purvis, has intervened on Kennedy's behalf, arguing in the strongest terms that this woman be admitted. It is out of my admiration for Miss Purvis and out of my respect for her judgment that I have been persuaded to bring this case before you. Thank you, Mrs. Bill. Perhaps we should hear what Miss Purvis has to say. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I can quite easily plead the case of Jimmy Kennedy simply on the grounds of Christian compassion. This is a woman who has suffered terrible injuries to her personal appearance, afflicted by men who are now mercifully in the hands of justice. Bear in mind her profession, her future will be bleeding deep if we refuse to take her on. I'll tell you what will happen to her, if you like. She'll descend to the lowest gutter of the old town, where she'll find herself in the hands of a bully who will be a former employer of Joe Brash, looked like a Sunday school teacher. He'll give her shelter and cheap liquor and laudanum in exchange for squeezing every penny out of her. Her body will no longer be her own, but will be available to every Tom, Dick and Harry that has two pennies to live together. But that's what she'll be worth, ladies and gentlemen. Tuppence a tap. Oh, I say, I say, it's most upsetting! Most I, upsetting. I say, Miss Purvis, need you be quite so graphic? Mr. Chairman, we are talking about a life here, a human life, left to the rooms of the society that we all live in. The consequences of that life will be dire. In fact, the only thing I can say to make things seem better is that at least it won't last very long. If we don't take Jean Kennedy, then she'll live no longer than five years. So this is a very large claim, Miss Purvis. So where is your proof? Two of our most successful inmates, Molly Stewart and Elizabeth Gibbons, came to us at Jean Kennedy's instigation. They have been brought here today to testify on her behalf. It was in the defence of the right of these women to live their own lives that Jean Kennedy sustained her terrible wounds. Furthermore, it was because of Jean Kennedy that the criminal brash was brought to book and given his just deserves. Mr. Mulder was here to testify in encouraging doing so. But surely it was uh, our own asylum officer, Mr. Gaines, that apprehended brash and not in fact the police. I think that's a small point, Mr. Kennedy. Gaines could only hold them and not arrest them. Your argument still stands. Nevertheless, Mr. Chairman, it is an example of how selective Miss Purvis has been. For all her impressive eloquence, she has carefully glossed over a number of points which are of the utmost significance. For instance, she has omitted to mention that, far from being a common street walker, Kennedy was in fact a madam in the brothel in which she was employed. Points of information, Chairman. Yes, Mr. Mill. It was passed by the governor some time ago that if a woman is fit to be employed, she is fit to be an employer. The fact that Jane Kennedy is a man should not be 
Point taken. Agreed, Mr. Kent? As you wish, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> May I say something, Mr. Chairman? Please do, Miss Todd, if you will. Now, as you all know, I find this talk of streetwalkers and houses about the nation most distasteful. Oh, Dad, some of our girls have come from that background. Perhaps they know a great many of them. But I like how to think of it. I have a thousand things each man from the inmate, the fallen angel. And it is the task of Mrs. Mill and the staff to see the wings of some black hole again, so that she may fly once more. However, I am much more broad minded than some of you may imagine. I have deferred to regulations, and the question of admission states quite clearly every woman in good health who has deviated from the path of virtue in any way, upon her request, and apparently sincere desire, may be admitted to the asylum. Now, it seems to me that this question of sincerity is the key. Disregarding the Kennedy woman's age and indeed her criminal record, is she prepared, truly and most humbly, to repent her sins and seek restitution? Is sincerity as important to her as it is for me? For me, sincerity is all. Before making a judgment, I must have evidence of sincerity. I require sincerity. I demand sincerity. I demand, ma'am. You have something to say, young woman. I certainly do, Your Honour. Mr. Chairman, please, this is not a court of law. Is it no, sir? Well, if you'll say that to me, it seems to me that you two and Judy Kennedy are on trial here, on trial for a life. The woman needs help. Are you going to help her or are you no? And if you're no, then forget it. God only knows who else from. But if you are, you can't put a price on that bill, because that price can't be paid and it can't be demanded, ma'am. No fee on anybody else, it can only be given. And even that can't be guaranteed. We talk a lot about freedom in this place. And what does it mean? It means putting our lives in order, making our own decisions and taking our own chances. When I leave this place, I'd like fine to find a good job and settle down. But what if I decide to go back on the streets again then? I'll be better fitted for it. I'll be able to read and write. Maybe Clara Johnson might still be interested in me. But if you say that I can't, or that there's anything you can do to stop me, then I'm not free, and everything this place stands for is nothing but a sham. I'm here today to tell you that Jeannie Kennedy is one of the most honest, straight-dealer women I've ever known. She wouldn't ask for your help if she didn't need it, so please, do what you can. She'll know what you're doing. I want to say that I do every work that Mama says. I want my life to do with Kennedy. Please help her. Please let her come in at the asylum. It's her only chance and God knows she deserves it. I'm afraid it's not quite as simple as that, my lady. <laughs> of course it is. Even if the woman does deserve help, quite personally, I don't think she does. I doubt it. We cannot possibly take every deserving case that comes along. Now this argument about Freedom and sincerity is all very well, but come on, we have to live in the real world. We simply do not have the resources to meet every case, deserving or not. So forgive me, Mr. Chairman, I cannot understand why we're spending so much time discussing this. The woman doesn't qualify and that's that. I'm not so sure, Mr. Cat. I think we should see the woman before we proceed any further. Is that really necessary? Oh, I think so, Mr. Cat. Do you have any objections? None whatsoever. I just Anyone else? No. Fine, bring the woman in then, please. I'm glad that you agree that we should see the woman first. I think this is a special case and we should make it every angle. Thank you. You are considering your admission to the asylum, but before we proceed, I would like to ask you one question. Why do you wish to come into the asylum? It was no idea of mine, sir. How can you rule? How can I did qualify? It was Marge, Miss Purvis, who asked me to ask. Was it indeed? Listen, Kenny, let me put it another way. Would you like to come into the asylum? With the greatest of respect, Mr. Chairman, I hardly think that comes into it. A lot of women, no doubt, would like to come into the asylum. Nevertheless, Mr. Kant, I wish to know. Kenny, do you wish to come into the asylum? Kenny? Oh, that's him. Him, Mr. Kant. 
Kant. Mr. Kant? What is it, Jean? There's your money man, Monica. Joe Brash's sleeping partner. He bought the houses. He bought the girls. He took the top share of the profits. Is this true, Mr. Kant? In a sense, yes, it is. I had dealings with Brash. I financed his enterprise. He took care of the operational matters, of course. Are you telling us, Mr. Kant, we have a brothel on our board? Oh, not now, Mrs. Torpatullo. Apart from the fact that Brash is in prison, we made a dreadful hash of things and I had to close them down. What happened to my girls? Both house and stock have been sold off. My agent took care of everything. Your agent? Another Joe Brash. Oh, someone far more efficient, I fancy. I'm bringing this meeting to a close. We will consider the Kennedy case later. We must also consider your present presence on this board, Mr. Kant. As you wish, Mr. Chairman. You will also consider, no doubt, the extent of the contribution that I make to the running of this place. Oh, no, that will not be a factor. As mistress of the mansion, I can assure you, we will run a little potato peelings and have another penny of your conscience money. Conscience money? My conscience is clear. My business affairs have only one thing in common with my dealings with this place. The wealth that my business, including my brothels, have created has enabled me to be that much more generous in my donations. And it has been generosity and nothing more that has persuaded me to give what I can to this The difference between a brothel and a factory as far as he's concerned. None whatsoever. He makes money out of both. Making money is his business. Of course he makes slums as well. And criminals and paupers. Starvation and disease. He blights the lives of whole generations of the working class. It has nothing to do with it. He's not to blame. He's not to blame. It's allowed, you see. We allow it. We accept the fact that the likes of Slater can are free to steal and cheat and exploit those in a weaker position. By the standards of our society, he can't be faulted. He's done nothing against the law. You know, listen, Bobby. They didn't care about anything like that. Not really, I know. But I know the same myself. Someday they'll see it. They'll have to. Maybe. But you and me, we'll not live that long. You and me? Aye, fine, though. Come here a minute, Bobby. I've got something I want to show you. Aye. I'll let you say, Bobby. Fine, Bobby.
Hun walk up here, side to side. Yourself, Tony, you do it first, Tony. Uh, Walk about, hey! Go walk about across the stage, okay? What he is? Occupation. Joe Bratch, brothel owner. Do me as well, just friend. Me close his mate. She's one of the best doers in Edinburgh. So, Glenn, Glenn. <laughs> so, Glenn, tell me a wee bit about Joe Brash. Joe Brash is uh, definitely a wee criminal. A nasty bastard, in fact. A criminal. A criminal, yes. In what sense of the word is a... He's a woman basher. Yes. Definitely so a very, basher. very unpopular member of the cast, I take it. Oh, I think so. Jolly good, jolly good. Like it? I'm going. Yes, Faye. That was the director. I've got to go. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Hello, you too.
Please. The character in the show. The character who you play, yes. Well, she's, a, she's been a prostitute lady of the night for many years. She's quite a strong character. She cares for the girl she's under her. And finally, do you find goes her, against her. Do you, find, do you find her a likeable character to play? It's a challenging character. Challenging role. Do you. Um, do you relate to him anyway? Um, <laughs> not, not, <laughs> not, 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 not in the obvious <laughs> sense, but um, is, is there much of your personality coming through? I think in your role you play a bit of your personality comes through. Yeah. Okay, man. Thank you very much. Who is your character, by the way, for reference? Jeannie, the madam. Well, she ends up the madam. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, mate. You're welcome. <laughs> You know what you can do with that? Hello, Reverend Mill. Um, Mike, can you tell me a wee bit about your character, please? Character? Not a lot, actually. It's uh, a lot of bolts in it. Uh, a lot this of bolts. This is the running out. This is running, by the way, yes. No, it's no running. Well, Mike, can you just, can, can you just tell me? Can you ask me this? Uh, okay, thank you very much, sir. Please, please. I'm ask trying to get behind the Reverend Mill. Okay. No, well, we I'll try again. Okay, Max. Uh, well, the character plays Mary Ann O'Neill. <laughs> She has two lines. She's an inmate in the asylum and uh, she's always called on when new probationers come in to sort of calm them down, take the street clothes off them, help them to get used to the place and just to be on hand. Okay. Thank you very much. Young man, who are you and who do you play? John Nelson. I play Jonathan Khan. Jonathan Cant, and who's Jonathan Cant, and how does he fit into the show? Well, he's, um... <laughs> he's, uh, is, is, is he the son of, um, Slater Cant, by any uh, chance? Uh, Slater Cant, too, is, um, the rogue, isn't he? He's a man who actually funds this whole operation, isn't he? The, the whorehouse, uh, so to speak, a word which you shouldn't know about. So, are you enjoying doing the show? Mm -hmm. you enjoying drama? Still doing it? Mm -hmm. oh, you've been doing it for a wee while now, eh? Can be an actor when you grow up? Hi. Oh, there's confidence for you. Thank you very much, Jordan. Hello, now we come across a rare specimen here, a director who is actually working. Oh, hey, come on. Jay Milligan, can I have a few words for you, please, about Victorian values? A wee bit nipple? There was a nipple on the screen, by the way. <laughs> Offie, can you just tell me a few words, uh, give me a few words about? What, what do you want to know? Um, yes, I should have prepared some questions here, actually, yeah? Very help. Uh, just, just, just give me your thoughts and feelings on how you think the show's progressed, how it's went, and um, well, how happy you are with the final outcome. I think I've got a wonderful cast, and that's helped. Really good script. The cast have just been terrific. Smashing. And you'd work with them again? Oh, yes. <laughs> there you go. What further recommendation could you want? Thank you very much, Faye. Thanks. <laughs> well, tell me about it, Jimmy. Tell me about your character. Tell me about Big Eki. Yes. He's one of Joe Brash's sidekicks. Yes. Do you like playing them? It's alright. You find them uh, uh, a lot more different for your own personality? Yeah. Or, or have you fitted a lot of yourself into it? Okay. No, no, really. No, no like attacking people. No, it's not really, not really your, uh, your uh, cup of tea, is it? Oh, well, right. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to interview someone else now. Great help. Thank you. <laughs>
This is uh, CFS TV reporting on location at the Arts Centre in Craig Muller. Here at Victorian Values, the 6th of October 1989. Oh, I beg your pardon, I'm a year behind, it's 1990. <laughs> this character here is Izzy. Rather, this person here is Izzy, I don't know if she's a character. Yes, she is a character. Now tell me, Izzy, can you tell me a wee bit about your character in the play? Hey, I'm a wee character in the play? Well, uh, I'm actually an inmate. An inmate? An inmate in the Magdalene. I used to be a poor. Oh, an inmate? An inmate, yeah. Yes. Used to be a what do you mean, used to be? I've recovered for that. And then the second half one, we just catch the small room. Oh, a little, a little bit up in the social class, I take it. Yeah. Yes, do you find, do you find that difficult, um, the two contrasting parts? Yes. Especially my character. Yes. Try Well, may I tell you now, I think you've coped extremely well with the pressures of, um, a show and um, I would recommend you to go into um, things about your character, about um, how you feel um, the character fits into the show and uh, do you enjoy doing it, that kind yes. of thing? Yes. 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 Is it running? Yes, it's running, yes. Well, the characters are really good. Yes. Uh, well, who are you looking at, by the way? I think I'm looking at the camera. I'm supposed to look at this or that or you. Uh, oh, uh, we'll look at the camera. Just that you were sort of very inquisitive there, you know. Well, I want to see actually inside the camera, like you know, like the inside of it. No, you want to see the audience looking at you. Exactly. You see the front rows, and the first night I could see them clapping halfway through the board scene, as trying, trying, you know, for us to get off. Oh, I suppose, right. I suppose that's because we were very boring. I see. Uh, from that. Well, I don't know. Well, maybe I. Well, I don't really want to comment from upon that. <laughs> Yes. Anyway, back to what we are talking about. <laughs> Mrs. Todd Patool. Uh, yeah, she's brilliant. She's yeah. brilliant. Um, over a bit over too, perhaps a bit over too over the top, but that's how I enjoy playing it because I would be bored otherwise. Well, precisely. I mean, exactly. uh, I have to enjoy it firstly, and no other be character Jessie's like the same thing goes. Like, yeah, she is rather over the top as well. But, uh, so but I think I think both of you fit into your personality. Would that be right? <laughs> I don't know over the top. No. Yeah. Well. well Only well, sometimes. Only sometimes. sometimes. I'm very quiet. I'll accept that. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I think I'll give the interviewing game up after this. <laughs> Now to the star of the show, uh, Molly Stewart, Janice. Can you tell me a wee bit about your character, please? I'm a nobody, me. Yes, I'm up and I'm running. Oh, it's okay, Caroline. Yes, Molly Stewart sounds a very interesting person. Yes. Yes. Well, you're embarrassing. Oh, come on, Janice, just talk about just, just a tart with a heart. A tart with a heart. Now, that, that, now what more can you say there? What more can you say there? Attack. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, it's a cause of further embarrassment. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> right, Paul, tell me a wee bit about Monk here, please. You've not got the thing closed. Go to the My name's Paul. Part of the CFS adult driver group. Uh, stage manager. And the co lighting designer. Uh, General Dr. Body. But I do actually have a part in this. His name is Bobby Monka. PC Plonka. Who is a policeman. In fact, I think he's quite a major part of this play because he carries the moral at the end really quite well. Although I have heard this quite a nice speech, but I think I feel it off really well. Um, it's basically his part is a coming of age for him. He goes through trauma and he becomes enlightened. So he's generally the main stage. Especially backstage. Unbelievably so. And here we come into the bowels of the whole operation, the stage crew. This is a lighting man, Frank, and... Ray. Ray <laughs> um, yes, I don't know his name, but he knows mine, doesn't he? No. Oh, there you go. How's that for style? And here we have Mr. Davy Smith, the odd job man who does absolutely anything and everything. I need to get time for it. But he's a gem of a man, believe me. Okay, Chaffee is always... Paris George Patterson Scott. The first? Second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, tell me a wee bit about yourself, Cyrus, and your uh, precise um, involvement with this production. 
After I came out of hospital through foot and mouth, I used to rear sheep. I joined this uh, drama club, which has been good, fun, and we put on three plays, uh, one pantomime, uh, Fit for Heroes, and uh, this one, which is the best so far. There you go. Thank you very much, Mr. Cyrus, blah, 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 the second. Thank you. You're welcome. Blah, blah. Mrs. Mill. I'm Mrs. Mill, I'm wife of the Reverend Mill, and I run the Magdalene Society for Fallen Women, having been a fallen woman myself in the past 20 years. I've taken up the streets by my dear husband. Jesus found you? No, but Reverend Mill found me. Oh, I see. Again, I think I should tell you a little bit about my character. Slater Cat, of course, is a real bastard. He's had girls on the streets for, well, for as long as I can know. And uh, he likes to be seen as being good and in with the, the in crowd. He is rather he's, conscientious, you know. Oh, yes, he's a very moral man. Mm. He likes to make money and has to right. be clean. But apart from that, anything goes. He is a bastard after all. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Um, Geras, can I have a few words with you? Really? You want to say the Daddy, Myself in the video. Mind your way, Paul. She's up there, maybe get her. Thank you for coming. Dismissed. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. You're so kind. This is to prove that we had an audience. I was just told me his twice and he's double it up. That's all right, Paul. How you doing, Gene? Very good. Good to see you. Hi, but you're not crew. Oh, I'll just use up the rest of the film. Oh, oh could not somebody take a picture of you? <laughs> I'm totally kidding, I'm just totally like Kerry to you. See what I mean? I'm filming the screen. Is that right? Come on, I got a picture of you last night, your face was filming the screen. Is this any worse? <laughs> I'm zooming out. Oh, can I write up my nose? <laughs> <laughs> See your brain. What? You slagging my stutter? Me? What? Do you want to do 